Here. Hello and uh, welcome. Back from the Grogan style of the launch of Hill and the Vanny's Boot, the Drum Cliff Pilots. And there's a most welcome. And I have, well, okay, I will introduce Tom Matches to get the proceedings going. Okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Habemus uh, Lieber, we have the book after 14 years' wait. And uh, it's nice to see it in this form because I am so familiar with it in the, in the other form as a sort of breeze block of typescript which uh, Kieran used to bring in here and plonk down on the table and when he, in between entertaining us with stories about the doings in the arts club and the backstage antics of Vincent Brown on TV3, he was working silently and secretly on the strangest story of all, which this book is. And it was my enormous privilege on one occasion to be, because we were all wondering, what could this be about? What is this curious enigmatic thing that he carries with him? And he, he gave it to me six months ago in its large and you know, undigested form and asked me to proof it. So I went home that night carrying it in my bag, very heavy it was. My, in, my arm was probably about an inch longer when I got home. And sat down, took out the red pen around midnight and began the corrections. Now, it came on about 6 a.m., the dawn came up, the last page dropped from my nerveless hand onto the ground, and it was one of the most extraordinary experiences I've ever had. It was, it was not unakin to having 15 magic mushrooms and watching four episodes of The X-Files back to back. It's possibly, one, possibly one of the strangest books I've ever written. Uh, what is it all about? Well, it's about 300 pages long, but it's also about the eternal struggle between good and evil, and particularly good in this case, are the good and honest fisher folk of small and picturesque uh, Ross's Point, and also the good fairies, the she, who behave themselves. Anyway, they, they have some kind of a dust-up or uh, trouble with the banshee and her satanic horde of demons and possibly goblins and werewolves and the like, and this local, this small local for affray turns into something that ends up very nearly being the apocalypse a hundred years later. Uh, the world almost comes to an end. But of course it doesn't really come to an end because if it did, there would be no sequel. I know that he's working on the sequel as we speak. Now, uh, having had this tremendous kind of brainstorm and mental assault, uh, my job was only to see whether there were any misspellings, were any grammatical infelicities. This I did. Uh, it fell to another man of letters, and a more important man of letters, I think, uh, J.P. Dunleavy, Mike to his pals, therefore J.P. to me. Anyway, J.P. Uh, said something very nice about the book. What he said, I think, is a hefty volume worth its weight. I assume the words in gold should have followed weight. He seems to have left those out. But uh, it is a true thing. This is a splendid book. Um, Worth its weight is true. It was extremely weighty when I had to carry it. Uh, Mr. Dunleavy never saw it, I suppose, in that form. Uh, something else I'd like to say about it is that uh, it, uh, it contains many scenes of red-hot sizzling sex. And it contains on page 285, a page it springs open at in, in my copy, it, it, it contains a reference to a gentleman called Monsignor Tom Matthews. And though it may sound like a fantasy, there's an element of gritty realism in, in it in that Monsignor Tom Matthews doesn't get any of the red-hot sex. This it makes it extremely realistic. Uh, I'm pleased, too, that it is an illustrated book because the tradition of illustrating books for adults is one that sort of faded out around 1920, I think, with, the, with Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes books, which were illustrated by Hamlet Brown. One thinks, of course, of Alice in Wonderland, uh, as Carol in Tenniel. One thinks of, I suppose, uh, one thinks, I suppose, of Cruikshank and Dickens. One thinks, perhaps, of even of Don Quixote and Dore. Something I wanted to say also about Tim Levy is when he wrote his own first novel, The Ginger Man, he had an extraordinary success with it. He managed to sell 45 million copies worldwide. So I'm going to wish Karen a lot of success in that department. Uh, though the end of the world doesn't happen in the novel, the end of the world has been predicted since the beginning of the world and it never seems to happen. I suppose sooner or later it will. It will. 
and I hope, I hope that the ending of the world is as happy as the ending of the novel. But something that does come along with monotonous regularity over the last couple of thousand years is Christmas. And any minute now is going to be Christmas 2009. And Jesus will be 2009 years old. And I think it would be only right to celebrate this happy event uh, by perhaps buying a couple of copies of Chiron's book. For some reason, it's amazingly cheap. It's only about 10 euros. Maybe it's a special offer tonight. But what could you get for 10 euros? You could get two pints in here. Good plan. You could get the two pints and buy the book. So I would like to thank everyone here. I'd like to thank you all for coming out on this, on this yeah, beautiful Irish day. Uh, I would like to thank Tommy Smith for the use of the hall and for his constant support of the arts, which is to be keep doing it. And, uh, and I would very much like to thank Kieran Deverney for writing the book and for according me the tremendous privilege of being allowed to launch it, as I now do. This book is well and truly launched. Thank you. Thank you. I think now there were good names for black babies, Chuck and long dead grandmother Martha. Did the others go to limbo, asked little also dead Billy, speaking out loud, a little more sure of himself. Shipwrecked Spanish sailors and stillborn and aborted unbaptized babies, laughed long dead grandmother Martha. Whatever happened to sailor Willie Crawley, the Portsmouth's black and white collie dog, who jumped out of his boat and swam to the shore as Willie rowed back from Coney Island after he delivered the mail, asked. Little also dead Billy, as an empty famine grave. Thank you. Silence for a couple of moments for Patsy's Dan McRory, King of Tory, ambassador for the Irish Island, commun Island communities. So Patsy Dan. Put me in with you. Well, first of all, Cade Mila Fortune of Agatha Thousand Welcome on behalf of my dear friend here, which I'm very honoured to be here this evening and to be requested to be here by uh, my dear friend uh, uh, Kieran. I met him, uh, had the opportunity and the honour to meet him qu uh, qu a couple of months ago, is that right, Kieran? Yeah. yeah. And uh, he had great love for my art, and when I heard that he has uh, been launching a book, I uh, jumped with joy and I said, well done, and it is happening this evening. Uh, at here that it is happening in uh, Grogan's pub, it couldn't be in a better pub in Dublin. White washed buildings lined the shore. Hundreds of brown-skinned, naked people stood on the beaches, waving excitedly to the travellers. At the Dread North grew even closer. Their arms became more than knocking, uh, uh, ongoing. Even heard the voices of her head first. They want us to come ashore, she whispered to Woolly. Can you hear them? I can feel them, said Wally. Let's join them, she giggled, unbuttoning the front of her dress to expose her white nest. Shouted Wally, Father, and we see them all all the time. Yeah, with another end, but not really. Gave me the money. Thank you. 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 Um, thanks to Tommy here for the hire of the hall, and thanks to uh, Patsy Dunn for travelling all the way from Tory Island in Donegal um, to join us this evening. Uh, thanks to Jim Carroll as well um, for um, giving up his rugby match to come and watch us. We still don't know the score yet, but I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll find out in the next half hour or so. But seriously, thanks to everybody. and. Uh, I can't say any more. Thank Thanks.
want to say thank you all for coming along, despite the fact of our sporting commitments. Nice to see an excellent crowd of people here, and I'm sure Kieran deserves it. It looks a very interesting read. I've read a little of it, and why shouldn't everybody go and get a copy of this book, which is available here right now? <coughs> and to bring these proceedings to a close, we have Patsy Dan McGrory, King of Tory, to play us a couple of tunes. Yes, yep. tunes. <laughs> Should I play some Patty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Should I play some Patty? Stay over in the town. 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 I played some Patty. Stay over in the town hall in Manchester as well. But I want to. So, what is this? This is a famous town hall. in English, the song of the Herricks. As an old man from Tory Island could no longer say, could no longer fish Herricks and got into the age of 80, whatever. And the cliff was only a few hundred miles, a few hundred yards away from him. Every morning he would take a run up to the cliff and walk up to the cliff. And as tears would come to his eyes, he sat at the, at the fire during the winter time and compose the song, The Song of the Harry. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 